everybody. Mike Vincent. Welcome to FEI Freight Executive Insights. I am not the freight executive with the insights today, but my new good friend and fellow LTL veteran, John Luciani, is. And he, <laughs> and he is the COO of LTL at A. Dewey Pyle. Welcome, John. How are you, Mike? Thanks, Mike. Good, good to be here with you today. I appreciate it. Appreciate you the like time the way together. I nailed the the pronunciation of your last name? Knocked it out of the park. I, I killed it, brother. It was fantastic. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, man. I mean, sure. it's, so you know, we were commiserating or talking about uh, LTL life. Uh, you know, once you're in trucking, you're in trucking, right? <clears throat> but then you're either truckload or LTL. I've, I've done, I've been in both worlds and they very much stay away from each other a, a bit. You know, it, it, there's a bit of competition. Truckload's better than LTL. LTL is better. <laughs> LTL is a bunch different <laughs> and, for sure. and a bit more difficult than, than, than truckload, right? You actually care what's in that truck, right? Absolutely. <laughs> every single shipment. Every, every single one. It, it, it actually matters what's in the truck. Not, Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but so how did you get into it, John? Did, were you just walking around and said, hey, truck's cool. Let me do this. No, nah, so, you know, it's funny. Is probably a lot maybe similar to you and a lot of guys from my age, uh, my, uh, you know, my vintage. Um, I worked on a dock when I was in college. Yeah. And, right? uh, I, you know, my original career aspirations were to be in law enforcement. And, um, you know, my, my uh, stepdad had a friend that was a terminal manager at St. Johnsbury Trucking, which is a, was oh, a northeast, wow. northeast yeah. region powerhouse. Yeah, and, St. Johnsbury, uh, you're going way back, right? Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. I fell in love with the industry. Um, and I've, I've been in the business since since 1990, you know, since probably 1985. It's crazy. Yeah. All right, so we are of the same vintage. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I stepped out to an open air dock in Toledo, Ohio, uh, and, and I loved working in the minus five forty mile an hour winds. Oh yeah, open. and I also loved the ninety five degrees uh, in the summer out sure. there uh, when they used to make you wear a tie, even though you were on a dock. Exactly. <laughs> right? And we were actually that Hagman Road facility roadway. You know what I'm talking about that. You know, I'm sure you know exactly where it is. Three sides con- uh, uh, bordered by a dump. What a great place to work in the summer. I'm sure. <laughs> and, and, you know, the business is a lot different today. I mean, you know, we got, we got the bug from either a uh, necessity working while you were in college and then fell in love with the business. Or today, you know, we uh, at Pyle, we have a very active management training program. And, you know, like Roadway did years ago, they recruit out of college. And, and uh, you know, we try to teach, we try to teach these uh, new college graduates the business of the business um, right after they get done with school. Yeah, right. And they're aggressive and they're hungry and they want to make it done. Are you still looking? Is it still the same? I mean, dude, when we started, everybody was the same. Right. We were we were athletic. We were aggressive. Everybody thought they could be the president of the company the next day. And they and, and they had. Right, you, you know what I'm you, I I know exactly what you're saying. I know. And everybody was exactly the same. I mean, you uh, walk into any terminal, it didn't matter if it was ADU Pile or, or New Penn or Pitt, Ohio or, or Roadway or Yellow. It was the same people running those right. docks, right? Is it absolutely it's still right. going over to the same same people or is it changing a bit to the tech side or what do you see? No, we're, you know, it's, it is changing, you know, work-life balance is much more important uh, to, to the, to our young leaders. And, you know, we've, we've got to, we've got to evolve uh, to, to be successful, you know, in, 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 in the old days, you could fish in another guy's pond. You could go hire a, a rep from, or a, a frontline leader from mm-hmm. pilot freight carrier, St. John's very trucking, yeah. PIE, Transcon. Well, PIE. You know, that, oh my God. <laughs> that, uh, you know, that pond is dried up. So now you've got to develop your leaders. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it, it just presents new and interesting challenges. And if you don't uh, evolve with the industry, you, you get left behind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I So when I was in, I was in Altoona, right. You talk about all the other, the other, and this pond that you could fish in. Right. So yeah. we, I was on the road I was on is plank road outside of Altoona. Right. And, and that was like my central hub there, you know, where Altoona, Pennsylvania. Yeah, right? smack dab of, yeah. Nowhere. Right in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> exactly. I mean, a hundred percent nowhere, <laughs> That's crazy. but, uh, uh, it, you had 
Yellow Roadway, ABF, Carolina, and Preston. All bordered each other, right down the road, right next to each other, right? And then over the years that I was there, eventually there was a Carolina uh, uh, tractor pulling an ABF ABF trailer with another roadway pup behind it going down the road. I'm like, what the heck is that? Just because... Things get so co-mingled and, and screwed up and, uh, man, crazy. That it is, is crazy for sure. What is going. But so you guys are, how are you guys uh, faring through the, through the, uh, LTL is a bit different than truckload, obviously, right? In, yep. in the operations of it. And a lot of people who are in, 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 in truckload don't really see or understand that difference. And we're not going to really get into that, but it is completely different. But it's also different from its impacts of a freight boom or freight recession, right? Sure. And we're obviously in a recession right now. How are you guys faring from that? Coming through the epi- the, you know, the, the the pandemic and then and then into this down trough. Yeah. So if I could just just step back a little bit, just give you a little little history on Pile. You know, yeah. Pile's a, a hundred year old. April first, twenty twenty four was our hundred year anniversary. Wow. We just celebrated a birthday. Same family ownership from April first, nineteen twenty four to wow. to where we are today. It's really phenomenal. You know, we're a, we're a, you know a privately held family owned business with the same founding family. Family leading the company today, uh, you know we're privately held, family owned, but professionally managed with family family influences, and that's 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 really special. You know we have uh, one active member of the third generation, Peter Latta, who's my boss. He's our CEO and and chairman of the board. He's uh, an attorney and a CPA by training and education, and then we have three active members of the fourth generation. Uh, my counterpart, Frank Ramirez, is married to uh, my boss's oldest daughter. Uh, his brother-in-law, Billy Ladd, is a director of enterprise services, which he's uh, he essentially runs uh, our technology initiatives and in industrial engineering. And then Jack Ladd, who is uh, Jimmy Ladd, is, was uh, our VP of national sales, retired about five years ago. Jack Ladd is a national account manager in the company. So, you know, we've really got a uh, Really special story here. Um, you know, unlike unlike a lot of companies historically, we know that our greatest competitive advantage is the 4,200 pile people that create the service each and every day. Yeah. And what's good for those 4,200 stakeholders of the business is not materially different than what's good for the six shareholders or owners of the business. So, and that's how we... That's how we treat the pile team. Uh, you know, we count on their discretionary effort. We work very hard to build trust. And one of your questions is about core values. You know, we know that our core values are essentially the rudder on the ship. And we, you know, we we talk regularly about empathy, about, you know, treating others the way they want to be treated. And that's ultimately, it's with respect. And if we create that good culture and good working environment, and then you couple that with, you know, we overtly tell the we tell our employees we take a long term approach in everything we do. We share our financial performance with our employees. They see the reinvestment in rolling stock, in terminal network infrastructure, in warehouse operations, and in technology. And most importantly, they see the investment in the pile team in terms of wage increases, benefits, paid time off, all those good things. You can't help but be enthusiastic and passionate about the business, and that's the secret sauce at Pile. And it all starts from all starts with our owners, starts from the top. And again, you know, in addition to sharing our financial performance, we get out regularly. Uh, we we uh, get out regularly with with the uh, with the Pile team, and we have what we call annual meetings, or essentially town hall style meetings, where we talk about the good, bad, and the ugly of the prior year, what our key mm. strategic initiatives going forward. Mm. And then, you know, halfway through the year, we'll go out and we'll have a hamburger with the team. And it's just all about open dialogue. And then we'll survey them anonymously to tell us, hey, how are we doing? Where are we lacking? Where are we falling behind? But where are we ahead? And, you know, what's funny is when you go out and talk to the pile team, the questions are mostly questions about we instead of me. And when when you have that we kind of scenario, they're about the greater good of the organization and you know mm. the team gets it. And that's yeah, what makes Pile different. 
And, and and that's awesome because if, if for that to be successful, you truly have to have that culture from the leadership down that is 100% committed to it because a false we culture is a killer. That's going to destroy a company in a heartbeat because the BS meters go off and it will just, it'll, it's better to just say, no, we're against each other. That's more productive than a false we. I agree 150%. You know, yeah. in, in, in our environment, it's uh, under promise and overperform. Right. And, uh, and that's what really kind of makes us different as an organization. I, I love it. You know, back in the day, we used to survey as well at Roadway Express. And it was funny because uh, it shows you the time. And you were around in those times. We're of the same vintage as we talked about. But if you as a manager scored above a 75 in popularity or – like below a 50, then you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As long as 30 to 40% of the employees hated you, you're doing a good job. Yeah, if you were over 75, if you were under 75%, you were soft. That's, <laughs> that, 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 that's exactly right. That's, that's the way it used to be in our environment. It's not adversarial. We count on, you know, we count our employees to tell us, Hey, how can we be more efficient? How can we reduce our claims cost? How can we reduce idling and reduce fuel consumption? Because those are all material impacts and drivers on our business. And we're a cost-based business. If we don't make a profit, if we don't manage our cost effectively, we won't be around another hundred years. And that's the secret sauce at Pile. It, it, it really is. And, and what you're describing is, in a nutshell, is valuing those employees uh, as much as those profits. Exactly. Right? I mean, because that's how you get those profits and that's how you do it. And if everybody's working towards the true meaning of the word sustainability of the con- of the company, right, to be here and everybody can work and have a steady, good job and retire from there uh, better than when they started, that's the plan, right? I mean, that that's the plan, right, when it comes down to it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I could talk all day about the different things we do. We provide career path opportunities, whether it's doctor, driver, and then, you know, you don't need a college degree to be a leader at Pile. If you have ability and ambition and demonstrate the desire to do more, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the training. Because, you know, people coming out of high school, there may be a number of different reasons why they don't go to college right away. And it could be financial, family issues, obligations, maturity, just a litany of things. But here... If you demonstrate ability and ambition, you're a good cultural fit. The company will make the right investment in you and help you to achieve your career goals. And that's also different. And people yeah, see well, that. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I always looked for when I was looking for a good LTL uh, management supervisor, employee of any kind, was that willingness to make a decision. You know, no has just make that decision and be able to learn from those mistakes. It truly was a fail, fail fast, learn and move forward. That aggressive ability to make a decision, go for it and then analyze and make the correct choice the next time is more important than anything else. Right. right? Absolutely. Because para- analysis to paralysis it, from every aspect in LTL is the death of the company. No doubt from, about it. From, from, from running a, a break bulk dock to to pricing out new freight, right? Absolutely. You know, it'll it'll kill it in a heartbeat. So how are you guys is that the difference in and let me ask you this. Let me ask you this cuz this is what I really wanted to get into a little bit was the pricing aspect of of the business, right? Cuz the dynamic pricing is out there and and changes in trying to go to just density based pricing and do away with class and all that other kind of stuff and uh the 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 developments in, you know, uh cubing and 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 uh, dimensioning at the shippers and and that type of stuff to avoid W&I corrections, those type of things are are changing the dynamics of the operations, no? Sure. Sure. So here at Pyle, I have responsibility for sales, operations, pricing, and industrial engineering. So I have a VP of yield management that reports to me. And, um, you know, pricing is, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's 50% art and 50% science because we do, we certainly, uh, you know, we have 24 CubaScan dimensioners in our network. So we very much rely on that data to validate our pricing assumptions. Um, you know, if the customer says they're shipping brake shoes and they're really shipping cotton balls, we want to know that because yeah, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, we only sell space on a trailer. Um, and, and you know, data and, and hey, you started with dynamic pricing. You know, I, I get a little bit nervous about dynamic pricing because, uh, 
you know, you be, you tend to commoditize yourself. I don't mm. think if you're a premium service provider, like like Pilers, for example, you know, our on time performance year to date is like ninety eight point seven percent on time. We go from Baltimore to Boston overnight with very high reliability. Our claims ratio year to date is a point two six percent of revenue. You know, customers will pay a premium if you provide predictable, reliable service. And we, you know, we talk about educating our, our customers about the what are the costs outside of the four corners of the freight invoice. So if, if you ship three pallets today with brand X and one delivers tomorrow and one delivers the following day and one delivers the third day, what was the cost of that impact, especially if that customer is shipping to a new customer? Mm. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're never going to, you know, we have to be a for-profit business. We want to charge a fair, we want to produce a fair charge. And, but, you know, as it relates to dynamic pricing, you know, we have our three PL blankets. Um, and, you know, beyond that, we haven't really been forced into a situation where dynamic pricing has been prevalent. I've watched some of the public carriers, a couple of the big public carriers, you know, they were very active in the dynamic pricing space. Their bill count goes up and their margin goes down. And that's not a recipe for success in my mind. Yeah. So we're, uh, we're more sitting on the sideline. We have the capability to provide cubic pricing, dimensional pricing, uh, because again, at the end of the day, we're dimensioning um, 42 or 43% of every shipment we handle every single day. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, see, we've got a good handle on our cost, and that's really the key. I got you. I was a W&I king, man. I could spot a correction from seven doors away. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> uh. I wasn't above measuring the inside diameter of, of <laughs> copper tube to change the class on that copper tube. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so you mentioned, you know, you, you, you as an operations guy, and I was an operations guy first and foremost. I was into pricing and sales and all that kind of stuff, but I was an operations guy. You know, we always talked about ugly freight, et cetera. And then, you know, the, the old adage, there's no ugly freight, just poorly priced. I'm not 100% sure that's accurate. Well, that's <laughs> Still not sure as an operation guy, I buy into that 100%. But so there's the dynamic, there's there's the idea of 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 uh, selective embargoing, if you will, right? Or or making sure you've got the right freight mix. That That is a, a big key in the operations and the success of LTL, right? I mean, that's, and that's one of the huge differences between truckload and LTL. Sure. So, so to your point, uh, in our environment, it's as, about as much as what we don't put on the truck as we exactly. do put on the truck, especially right. in a tight driver market. You know, I was, you know, we, we, we are very selective. We handle very little grocery warehouse business. We handle zero big A business. If you know who the big A is, oh, yeah. um, you know, and, and because to me it's, you know, in a tight capacity market, uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have a driver sitting against the dock at a grocery warehouse for five hours making 10 pallets into 30 pallets at the SKU <laughs> level and then to fight with the shipper about detention because you were 10 minutes late for the appointment. So we, uh, we've made some very, uh, some very specific decisions as to certain business that we will handle and what we won't handle. Um, you know, we, in a tight capacity market, you know, just like everybody else, we're looking at over dimension shipments. Uh, we've done some creative things related to uh, residential deliveries, uh, you know, where we've got the shippers to agree that we'll just put the freight out for delivery. So when they're, when the customer is buying on that shipper's website, they know that pilot's an overnight lane and pile will put a, will put a, uh, essentially a rain jacket on the pallet and put it as close to the building. And, you know, we deliver hundreds of residential deliveries every day and we have very, very little noise. And that type of, that type of creativity has helped us to reduce our cost, which again, we can gain share with the shipper. You can imagine if we were delivering these residential deliveries and there were all kinds of quality issues related to either theft or damage, if we weren't providing good quality service, mm. they would yeah. tell us, Hey, you got to stop that because there's no accountability. And that's not the case. And that's a credit. Then once again, that's a credit to the pile team. And that's why we're, we were so culture and, employee engagement focused, always again, looking to build trust, always looking to count on our employees discretionary effort, because again, that's been the secret sauce for a hundred years. Yeah. Are you, are you, is, is the, is the increase of size of residential 
deliveries that occurred during, you know, during the pandemic. Is that, has that remained? Have you seen that still? There? It's probably pulled back a little bit, Michael, yes. but uh, yeah, this, you know, people, you know, Amazon has had a, Amazon's had a pretty significant impact on, on, you know, customers' supply chains, shippers' supply chains. And, you know, as a regional carrier, you know, we're, we're ideally suited. I mean, we go from, we go from Richmond, Virginia to Bangor, Maine, uh, as far west as Cleveland, Ohio. And, you know, the greatest consumer population in the country for sure is along the I-95 corridor, especially in the Metro, as sure. you, were, you were talking early on. And, uh, you know, if you can, if you have the infrastructure and the technology and the resources to service that consumer population, then you, you, you're probably pretty well positioned. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but I, I did. I didn't back in the day. We didn't have those resources. I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> well, residential delivery can certainly be challenging, but um, yeah. you know it's an important part of our business, and, and I think we do a pretty good job of it. Yeah, that, that's excellent. So, uh, as you're aware, there's uh, a segment of the uh, freight industry that's experiencing a, uh, a a bit of a freight recession. <laughs> sure. I don't know. If, I don't know if you're aware of that or not. I, yeah, but, I might have heard about it. Yeah, I might have heard about it. But I mean, if you're in the business, you understand those indicators, right? Both pre-indication of what's going to happen, you know, the, a trough or a, or a, or, or a peak. Uh, and the dynamics between truckload and LTL are, are tremendous, right? The, I remember the, the, the summer uh, of uh, after, you know, the shutdown, right? We shut down like January or March, I guess we, sh- we shut down for, co- you know, with COVID and everything like that. Everything started to shut down. But then by the middle of that summer, things were exploding. And I had a, an LTL colleague call me and say, what in the hell is going on? We just had our largest revenue spike for a month. And I know it isn't because our sales reps suddenly became smart. And I was like, well, it's because there's no LT- there's no truckload capacity. Right. And everybody's breaking it up into the, you know, the volume spot market contract moves. It's like, ah, and they were getting burned because, you know, the, you have to switch the use of that type of pricing depending on the volume of those that you're getting. Right. Right. So, so that's an indication of what was going on in capacity in the freight boom. Right. Are you feeling the trough? Is it reached LTL now? Uh, so, you know, I mean, I, I guess my response is, you know, we're kind of bucking the trend at pile. Uh, we've had, okay. uh, you know, we were in a freight recession, there's no doubt, from the uh, the second half of 2022 to the first half of 2023. And, uh, you know, Yellow yellow finally closed their doors and officially in August of 23. And our business has right. really been robust since then. Uh, you know, high single digits, low double digits, um, month over, you know, we look at co- month over month and then you kind of normalize. We look at shipments on a per day basis, which, you know, in, in, in uh, March, we had uh, two less work days than March of 23 and April, we had two extra work days just because of the way the calendar fell. So, you know, we, that's why we look at it. We look at the month for the number of work days in that month. And then we look at the business on a per day basis and, sure. and we've kind of, we've been bucking the trend. And, and part of that is, um, you know, I, I think our shipment size is smaller. Our customers are making as many shipments, but there's constant, constant needs are buying uh, less quantity mm. uh, just mm. because mm. of, you know, concerns with the economy, infl- inflation, uh, cost of goods, Cash flow, et cetera. The cost of money is more expensive these days, um, mm-hmm. but clearly, you know, we're we're, we're bucking the trend um, because the shipment size is smaller. Here's an interesting fact: it's harder for the truckload guys to go find these volume LTL shipments and put them together on it and make a truckload or yeah, a truckload yeah. stop off, just because the the economy is in a little bit of a recession still. Yeah. Um, but you know, we've we've done some creative things. Uh, in terms of uh, new business verticals that we've 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 moved into, and you know we've had some geographic expansion kind of at the same time, and that's created a little bit of a buffer. And you know, unlike truckload, the barriers to entry in LTL are difficult. I mean, if you look at the yellow auction and some of the some of the dollar values that those terminal or service centers went for uh, financially, I mean, just you know. We looked at a term. We, we we bought a terminal in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, that you know was twenty twenty five million dollars. It was a, an eighty door terminal in Trenton, New Jersey, that went for seventy one million dollars. It just was the cost per door was staggering. Yeah, you know, truckload guy, you just 
you just it's it's how do you get into that how do you yeah, no, no. The barriers to entry are much, much greater in LTL. There's, there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. So, what are you guys looking towards the future? You guys is it very much like a truckload? Truckload's kind of thinking, yeah, hey, we're going to drag on for a bit in in this area here. Does this, does that bode well for what you guys are are thinking and and where you guys are at? Or, uh, I guess, what is your final thoughts on 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 where we're at and where the industry is at this m- well, moment? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's an election year, so it'll be a little bit of a wait and see for most people. You know, we're yeah. financially conservative, so, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're always going to, we're always going to err on the side of maybe a downturn and we're going to be nimble enough. I mean, your comments about COVID were right on. Our business went dropped 40,000, 40% essentially overnight and we had to adjust. You know, asked me, you know, one of your questions was about challenges and, and the COVID pandemic was the greatest challenge. Uh, of my career, but, uh, you know, we're conservative. So I, I, I think that, uh, I think LTL will remain relatively stable for the rest of 2024 because there's good pricing discipline in the market. There's not a lot of excess capacity, um, mm. guy, you know, companies that have added additional service centers, you know, they have been disciplined and not reduced the price to put more freight in the truck line. And as, as long as that, you know, you don't have that uh, that pricing action that all come creates an avalanche of, you know, the pendulum swings back the wrong way. Uh, I think 2024 is going to be an okay year, honestly. Yeah. All right. That's that's awesome. Hey, I appreciate that very much, John. Hey, there's every shipper on the Eastern Seaboard is is listening to this right now. Where, where are they going to book their next LTL shipment, man? Let's fill out those trucks, brother. Cube utilization, my friend. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Well, Let's Mike, I appreciate you having me on. I always love talking about pile and always love to, uh, you know, chop it up with an industry veteran. Hey, amen, brother. Keep uh, keep it going, brother. Hey, and the best dock production is zero. Right? I'll keep, build, I'm going to contemplate that. Yeah, just hey, build your build your build your direct loads out on the pickup side of your P and D operation and mm. save some money. Right on. <laughs> Right on. Peace and love, brother. Thanks for being right, here, man. everybody. Thanks for thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time on FEI.